Well, we are just delighted that Pastor Doug is able to share with us night after night. Have you been blessed by the presentations? You know, I've heard these presentations before, and each time I learn something new. And so it's just a great blessing to be able to study the Word of God together. So I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come. You know, Pastor Doug, we're about halfway through this 10-part series, and as they say, the best is yet to come. We've got some exciting presentations still coming along. What, what's in store over the next few days? Well, tonight we're going to be talking about giant faith. We're going to be studying some of the inspirational stories about Joshua, Caleb, and David and Goliath. Talking about Jonah this week. Talking about Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's more. Keep coming. All right, absolutely. Well, God bless, Pastor Ross. Thanks so much, Pastor Ross. Good evening. So good to see each of you. Thank you for coming. You know, we always have a great attendance on the weekend, and then sometimes it thins out, but you folks are being faithful straight through. I'm wondering, how many of you have not missed a night yet? Some of you. Oh, bless your heart. Karen has not missed a night yet. I'm so glad <laughs> that Mrs. Bachelor is with us. I haven't missed one either. <laughs> well, I also want to greet, I know Pastor Ross did, the uh, people who are watching online. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Roku, and uh, the different networks. We know that uh, there's thousands out there that are studying the Word of God with, with us. And I hope that as we're conducting this series, we trust you're being blessed. But it's only the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So pray. Pray as I preach. Pray for these presentations. The time in which we're living, it's so crucial that we understand God's will. Amen? Amen. Well, I'll, our message tonight, as I mentioned, is giant faith. And uh, I thought I'd start with a little amazing fact. A uh, young Jake Oliver was walking through a park in England one day, 12 years old, when he was accosted by a mugger. And he said, give me your phone. Well, he was reluctant to give away his phone because he had worked hard and saved money to buy his phone. His parents insisted that he buy it himself. And so when he refused, the man, who was at least a foot taller, swung at Jake. Well, Jake sidestepped the swing, and then he gave him a very swift punch in the nose, broke his nose, blood went everywhere, and the attacker fled. What he didn't know was Jake, though 12 years old, was the world karate and kick jump boxing champion. <laughs> and he had just picked the wrong young man to rob a phone from. We always love those uh, stories about how the little guy wins over the giant. You know, the Bible tells us about giants very early in the book of Genesis. If you've got your Bibles, you can look in Genesis 6-4. A lot of people struggle with this. It says, there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore them children. These were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, I've heard some really crazy theories about this when they say the sons of God married the daughters of men. Some think that these were fallen angels or aliens, and they had these bizarre children. No, friends, not at all. You see, there were two classes back then. The children of Seth, who are faithful to God and still worship God, were called the sons of God. The Bible says in John chapter 3, what don't you know what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God? And so those faithful to God began to intermarry with the daughters of Cain, the sons of men. And the Bible talks about believers not intermarrying with unbelievers because then you get the wrong influence. And you say, well, why were their children giants? It's called genetic vitality. Do you know what a liger is? A liger. I think I got a picture on the screen there of a liger. Liger is the biggest cat in the world. It is a cross between a lion and a tiger. And the largest male in modern times that they've recorded was 12 feet long and 800 pounds. It's called genetic vitality. You often get gigantic offspring when the children of Cain had been separated for many generations from the children of Seth. But when they intermarried, there was that additional vitality and they were giants. But you see this even in the Bible. You look even after the flood. Deuteronomy 3.11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnants of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead, nine cubits in length, four cubits in width. That's 13.5 feet long. 
Now, get a little slide on the screen. The first tall character you see there, that would be Og, the king of Bashan. The next one is Goliath. He was nine and a half feet. Og was over 13 feet. I got him up. Oh, 11 feet. I'm sorry. I'm going by, I'm getting my cubits and my feet mixed up. Sorry. 11 feet. Once you're that big, what difference does it make? <laughs> and then, um, yeah, if you read history, you'll remember when uh, Magellan went through Tierra del Fuego, they stopped in Patagonia. And the sailors all say there were people there that were giants and they actually captured one. They say there was one man that was 10 feet tall. Now, it's not just one captain, but the crew swears by it. And that's, by the way, Patagonia means Bigfoot. And that's where the land gets its name. They had giants. Karen and I went on a diving trip in Australia. And there was a friend from Chicago there. And this is not a very clear picture, but that's Eric Gingold. He used to play with the Chicago Bulls, had a car accident, and he was injured. He couldn't continue to play with them. He was, he's the tallest Jew in the world, he's happy to tell you, seven foot four inches. And, uh, and that's me. And he's not even standing up straight there. Karen took this picture. But um, that's in modern times. And he's not the tallest person in the world. So there really were giants. And there still are. But uh, the Bible tells a story where once God's people were intimidated by the giants. Some of you know American history. And the, one of the greatest land purchases in history was what they call the Louisiana Purchase. When Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon needed money for his wars, and Jefferson said, well, let us buy all the territory from the, you know, the, the uh, Missouri River westward. And they bought this incredible swath of land that went from St. Louis all the way up to Oregon. Of course, the Spanish dispute that, but that's how far we thought it went. And uh, they bought it, but he said, we're not sure what we bought because there was almost no exploration that had gone west of the Mississippi. So they got together this team of Lewis and Clark, and there were about 44 men that were carefully handpicked, and they sent them, and they said, Jefferson was also a scientist, he said, get samples of the plants and the animals and tell us about the geography and see if you can find a water route to the Pacific. Of course, they ran into the Rockies. There was no water route. But after, between 1803 and 1806, they went, what was it, 8,000 miles, and they lost one man to appendicitis. It's an incredible story. You know where Jefferson got the idea? From the Bible. He remembered in the Bible that when Joshua brought the children of Israel, the children of Israel, the promise of the borders of the promised land, they had not seen the promised land in many years. In many years. No one alive then had seen it. And actually, this is what happened.
samples. You know, Lewis and Clark spent a whole day with their men catching a prairie dog. <laughs> and they managed to finally catch one prairie dog, and it made it back alive to Washington. And you can go to Washington, and they, when it died, they stuffed it. And it's still there today. That's called too much information. <laughs> so, he said, bring back some fruit of the land. It was the season of first ripe grapes. So this is happening now in the fall. So they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near the entrance of Hamath. And they went through the south and they came to Hebron. That's where uh, Abraham is now buried. And they went in Ahiam, Shashiah, and Talmai, descendants of Anak, who is a giant, were there. And Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol. Now they're up north. And there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they carried it between the two of them on a pole. Can you imagine a cluster of grapes so big it takes two men to carry it? If you go to Israel today, they've got a logo for the tourism industry. And the logo is two men carrying one cluster of grapes in honor of these first tourists that went through the land. Now, right away, there's a difference between ten of the spies and two of them. When they first crossed the Jordan, one of them says, how in the world are we going to ever get a million people across this river? Well, we found that out last night, right? But he didn't know, so he created some doubts. Then they came within the view of Jericho, and they said, how are we ever going to conquer a city fortified like that? Look, the walls are massive. Historians say they could ride chariots around the top of the walls of Jericho. And then they went up into the foothills of Hebron where the Anakim lived, the giants. And they said, whoa, they are so big. How are we ever going to conquer them? Now, the attitude of Joshua and Caleb was completely different from the other ten. They saw the Jordan River and they said, oh, look at this, you can throw a rock across it. And after they ferried across the river, they said, look at, look at the springs for Jericho. Look at the palm trees. Look at the dates. They got up to the mountains where the giants lived, around Hebron. And Caleb said, wow, look at the soil. Look how green and verdant everything is. There's honey dripping from the trees. And, you know, the Bible calls it a land flowing with milk and honey. And that was literal. You can read about a story in the Bible where Jonathan is in a battle and he's going through the woods and he's hungry and he sticks his spear into a puddle of honey on the ground. You remember reading that? Flowing with honey. And I guess there was so much vegetation and flowers and clover that the goats and the cows, their udders would squirt as they walked because <laughs> there's milk and honey. We used to have milk goats. If you don't milk them on time, they'll milk themselves. They'll start anyway. And so it was a rich land, and Caleb said, I want this land. Look at the springs and the southern exposure. And, and as they're going through the land, ten of them keep focusing on the problems. Joshua and Caleb focus on the promises. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, oh, man, look at these pomelos. You all know what a pomelo is? It's like a massive grapefruit. They're, they're in the Middle East, and they're tremendous, but they're different. And they get the pomegranates, and they get the grapes, and they got the figs, and they got the dates. And, and Joshua and Caleb, I can just picture it. They say, oh, these, these guys got to see this. These, some of these dates. And they got sticky dates in their pockets. And then they, they say, oh, man, look at these figs. And they got figs. I can eat a few. We got to take some back. And, and when they saw the grapes, they said, we got to show them a cluster of grapes. And the other guy saying, you know how heavy that's going to be? Well, well, we'll carry it together. And two of them, I think it was Joshua and Caleb carrying the grapes, we're so excited. They couldn't wait to tell everybody. But Joshua and Caleb were also worried that the negative attitudes of these other men were going to poison the minds and create fear and doubt in the hearts of the others. So after circling through the land, it says when they had spied out the land, they came to the people. Verse 23, they got that cluster of grapes, and it says in verse 25, they returned from spying the land after 40 days. How many days? That plays in D. And they departed and came back to Moses and to Aaron in the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran by Kadesh. 
That's Kedesh Barnea. And they brought back word to them, to all the congregation. Now, someone watching from the congregation, they didn't know when they were going to come back. You know, when Lewis and Clark showed up three years later, everyone had written them off as dead because they did not know how wide North America was. They had miscalculated how wide the country was. And when they didn't come back after the second year, they thought, well, Indians got them. And there was such celebration when they finally came back. So when someone is looking through their binoculars, uh, they, they, they used to take a, a piece of bamboo and look through it. They're, they're looking and they see on the horizon 12 men coming and the whole congregation comes together and they blow the trumpet and said, they're back, they're back. And everyone wants to hear word about the promised land. And it says it looks like two of them are running out in front and they're carrying something. I think Joshua and Caleb wanted to get there first to try to set a positive note. And they come back, but listen to the report. And they brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. I think Joshua and Caleb had a cloud of fruit flies following them. And they told them, they said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit. And they're tossing grapes to people and say, duck, here comes a grape because these are big grapes. And they're throwing the figs and the pomegranates and everyone's going, ooh and ah. But then the other 10 guys caught up. And they gave the minority report. No, the majority report. <laughs> the more minority report is very positive. But here's the majority report. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the termites, and the gigabytes, and the Canaanites, and they dwell by the sea, and along the banks of the Jordan. And everybody's hearing this, all this negative information that they're giving, and they're going, oh, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, we don't want to go back to the wilderness, and we don't want to go back to Egypt and be slaves, and now we can't enter the promised land. And it's amazing how in five minutes you can lose a, a massive experience of victory and faith if you listen to the devil for five minutes. How could they so quickly forget how they got there to the borders of the Jordan? All the plagues that God hailed upon the heads of the Egyptians to set them free, ten mighty plagues, the, the fire and the hail and the darkness and the frogs and the lice and then he parts the sea then there's a plague on the first, firstborn during the Passover. Then they get hungry. He gives them bread from heaven. Gives them water from a rock. They hear the voice of God talking to them from a mountain. What nation has ever heard God speak to them? They see the pillar of God's presence right there before them. And then they've got the audacity to listen to a little negative report that says, I don't know how we're going to ever get in the promised land. Why was the promised land called the promised land? Because God promised to bring them in. But instead of listening to the promise of God, they started listening to the negative questioning report of these messengers, who, by the way, were all church members. <laughs> Isn't that right? They were all Israelites. They went to the same church as Joshua and Caleb. We just read the Bible says they were leaders. And they said, we can't make it. Now, this is where I'm going with this. And I'm going to try and reiterate it through a few different stories. God has said that he can save you if you will be saved. Amen. The devil doesn't want you to believe it. Of course, the devil is the one who told Eve, trust me, don't trust God. Eat the forbidden fruit. And how did that end? When we don't believe the word of God, God can do for us what he says he can do for us. Amen? Amen? But you're always going to have people say, ah, maybe others, but not me. And maybe there's a few elected people he's going to say, but maybe I'm not one of the elect. And everybody begins to question and wonder if it's possible for them to make it. When you pay for something, do you hope to be able to take it home? If I go to the store and I buy something, I do my best not to leave it at the cashier's desk. <laughs> I try to take it home. I have forgotten, but I always go back. And um, I remember buying something and leaving it there and realizing the next day I left it, I went back and I talked them out of it. 
And they got it. Karen's good at that too. <laughs> Would God have sent his son and paid for all of your sins and suffer like he did if it was not possible for you to be saved? So the question is, who do you believe? You've got two reports here. I'm not done yet. Let's, let's keep reading. After they gave this negative report, the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Verse 30, as everyone began to murmur and whine and cry, Caleb, he jumps on a rock where everyone can see him and it says he quieted the people. Now, why did he have to quiet the people? Because they were all moaning and making a lot of noise. He quieted the people. Now, he was one of the spies before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him, meaning the other ten, they said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad or an evil report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we had gone as spies is a land that devours. Now the land is eating people up. They kept making it worse and worse. It's not just the giants in the cities. The land will eat them up. The land is a land that will eat up all the people. And the men we saw are men of great stature. They were the giants, the descendants of Anak that came from the giants. And we felt like grasshoppers in our own sight. So now they're doing something that's called grasshopper thinking. They kept looking at how big the problem was and they did not consider how big the promise is. The devil wants us to think like grasshoppers. God wants us to think in big ways. We serve a big God. Can you say amen? Do you know that you and God are always a majority? Amen. If you've got God on your side, all things are possible. Amen. You know, that's why Jesus, when the disciples got scared in the storm, and they woke up and he said, why were you afraid? I'm with you. Do you think I'm going to go down? You know, if you got Jesus with you, your ship is an unsinkable ship. You don't have to be afraid. God was with them. Why had they lost faith? Now, I got to be careful how I say this, but I want to tell you the truth. So here you've got, these are all Israelites. You've got 10 of them saying, we are not able to make it because the enemy's bigger than we are. And you've got two of them that are saying, we are able to overcome. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, seven times, to him that overcomes, 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 I'm counting, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Now, did Jesus make it clear it's possible to overcome? Why would Jesus say, I've got all these promises for those that overcome if it was not possible for you to overcome? Anything God asks you to do, he will empower you to do. If God says, this is the promised land, I want you to go take it, then don't say, I don't think we can, because if God's telling you to do it, you know you can do it. Because as Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. The Bible promises, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So are we talking about giants, Doug? No, metaphorically, the giant that you and I grapple with is, well, it's the devil and sin in particular in our lives. Thinking, how can I be an overcomer? How can I change? I keep making the same mistake. I fall again and again in the same area. And I feel so weak. And then I hear pastors stand up and they spend all their sermon time talking about grace, which I believe in God's forgiveness and grace. You heard that, amen? But they don't spend enough time talking about courage and victory. That you can change. That the power of God can make the alcoholic sober. The power of God can free the addict from drugs or pornography or pride or whatever the problems are. God can save you from your sins. I have no patience when I hear pastors and other religious leaders just talking about God saving us with our sins because the way I read my Bible, the angel told Mary, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. 
when I came to Jesus, my problem was sin. And you know, drinking and smoking and using drugs and cursing and living immorally and all these sins and bad vocabulary. And God, little by little, He convicted me. It didn't change all at once. But He convicted me and I just praise Him because I kept seeing how He was transforming me. He gives you a new heart. Things say, the Bible says, old things are passed away. All things are made new. Behold, you're a new creature. You are born again. So the idea that you cannot have victory over sin is unbiblical. Amen. Now, I'm not teaching perfectionism. I hope folks understand that. I'm not saying that we turn into some kind of sterile stainless steel robot. You're going to be you, but you can be holy. Because the Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. God wants to purify your heart. Amen. How many of you want that blessing? Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. And so it is possible for you to conquer the giants. Amen. You can enter the promised land. I believe Caleb. I do not believe the other ten, even though they may be in the majority. Moses is the one who said, do not follow a majority to do evil. It's often the crowd that does the wrong thing. He said, let us go up. We are well able to take it. And the people said, no, we can't do it. And so all, I'm in chapter 14 of Numbers, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And they began to say, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness why did the Lord bring us out? Be careful what you pray. Why did the Lord bring us into this land to fall by the sword? So they said, let's select another leader and go back to Egypt. Can you imagine the people wanting to go back to the slavery of Egypt? And yet I meet people in the church that say, I, I want to I say I'm a Christian, but I want to go back to the slavery of the devil and sin. Jesus wants to save you from your sins. He wants you to be set free. He wants you to enjoy the peace and the um, security of holiness that He's offering. Well, you know what ended up happening? A plague broke out among the people. And those men who gave the negative report died in that plague. And God says, because you did not believe me and you have been testing me all this time after all I did to save you, I'm paraphrasing now. He says, for every day, those spies looked at the promised land 40 days. You're now going to wander for 40 years until that whole generation dies off. I will bring your children that you said would never make it. I will bring them into the promised land. And that's what happened. The only two people, 20 years old and older than 20, that made it into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. Very interesting demographics when they finally crossed over. That means there are only two people over 40 years of age. No, see, over 60. Only two people over 60 out of 2 million. They had all died off because of what? Unbelief. It says in Hebrews 11, those, that generation did not enter in because of unbelief. Friends, the, the message is a message of faith. Amen. All things are possible to him that believes. And Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. If you believe, he can do anything. People came to Jesus and they said, Lord, yeah, I believe you can heal my servant and, and uh, you don't even need to go. And Jesus said, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel because you believed it. I'm not going and your servant's healed. A lady came to Jesus and said, I, my daughter's demon possessed. Speak the word and she'll be healed. He said, because of your faith, your daughter is well. And then a man brought his son to Jesus and said, Lord, if you can do anything. Jesus said, ah, ah, that's a dirty word for me. It's a two-letter word, if. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible. There were two thieves on the crosses next to Jesus. One of them said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, Lord, you've got a kingdom. Remember me. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. The other one said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. He was not saved. He said, if. The devil came to Jesus in the wilderness and said, if you're the Son of God, right away the Jesus knew who that was. It was a devil. If. He's always casting doubt. Has God said you're not supposed to eat? Always creating question and doubt about the Word of God. 
We need to believe, friends, all things are possible. There's an incredible power of faith that God's offering us. Now, I want you to jump ahead to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 14. We're fast forwarding 40 years. This is now, we're jumping over where we read yesterday after Joshua and the children of Israel get into the promised land. They're conquering, they're taking possession of the promised land. Caleb comes to his old buddy Joshua. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said to him, You know the word the Lord spoke through Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me, they made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore to me that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord. That means he believed God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. Listen to this, friends. And yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is my strength now. Wouldn't you like to feel the same at 85 as 40? Both for war. He says, God, going to go out to war. Both for war, for going out and for coming in. And now I love this. Verse 12. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. You know what he's doing? He's pointing up to the mountains of Hebron where the Anakim lived. And Caleb is saying, give me this mountain. That mountain with giants, and I will conquer it. I want that. It's got, the giants took the best part, you know, because they're big. He said, give me the mountain. I will cast out the giants. I will conquer them. I believe that God will be with me. What courage. Some of you ought to pray that prayer. You struggle against giants in your life? Say, Lord, give me this mountain. Jesus said, if you got faith, you can say to the mountain, be plucked up and cast into the sea. We all struggle with this mountain of sin that needs to be overcome. If you've got faith, you can move mountains. Amen? Amen. Caleb says, give me this mountain on which the Lord sp spoke in that day, how the Anakim were there, that the cities were great and fortified. It may be the Lord will be with me and I'll be able, I will be able, remember what he said? To drive them out. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephani, as an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kenazite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. You know, to this very day, the, the tribe of Caleb was Judah. And that's where you get the word Jews. Not every Israelite is a Jew. They were all Hebrews. But all the descendants of Judah, Levi, and Benjamin are typically called the Jews. And it's because of the faith of this old man who said, I believe God is able, that's how they got the territory to the south. Because he wanted the best country for his people. You know, I believe that um, God still helps us to conquer giants. And you need to have courage if you're going to be a Christian. Amen. Jesus said, we've got to believe. All things are possible. Do not fear. Christ said, you know, the Bible tells us there's 365 times in the Scripture where God says, fear not, fear not, fear not. He doesn't want us to be afraid. Now, here's, the, here's that famous story. People around the world know this story that never read the Bible. The story of David and Goliath. Sometimes we save it for the little kids in Sunday school or Sabbath school, and, and there's a lot of good theology in here for the adults. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies to battle, and they gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel, that's the king, were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. You got the Philistines on one mountain. There's a creek between. You got the Israelites on another mountain. And the Philistines stood on one side, the Israelites on the other side, and they taunted and they hurled spears and things at each other. But they hadn't really engaged for battle. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. 
He was two feet taller than our friend Eric I showed you. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. It was, you know, a big log for his spear. And the iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, 22 pound spearhead. Spearheads are usually pretty small. Go to the gym, pick up 22 pounds. And you'll say, that was on the end of the spear? How could you hold that? And it says, the staff of his spear like a weaver's beam. And his shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you're the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me, notice if he's able, to fight with me and to kill me, then we'll be your servants. No sense in our armies all being decimated. You send out your best. Philistines send out their best. Whoever wins, that'll settle the argument. If I prevail and kill him, then you shall be our servants. And if he kills me, vice versa. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man. When Saul, the king, and Israel heard all these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. There you have it again, God's people being afraid. They lost their courage. They were afraid. And now it introduces a boy. And when we say a boy, I know the stories always like to show him that he's you know, just a kid, but he was probably 18 to 20 years of age. He technically didn't go to battle until you were 20, and because Jesse told him to stay at home, he's probably still under 20. His brothers are in the battle. Father says, David, you need to bring supplies to the army. They didn't have, you know, government taxes back then. Everybody just would send from their farms to feed the soldiers in the field. So David brings his donkey load of supplies to his brothers, and they always gave a little something to the captain and the officers. And as David's distributing the food, guess who comes marching out for the 40th time into the valley and issues his challenge? Now, David, they didn't have newspapers back then. He didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, Goliath comes out. He's stomping around and taunting and mocking God. And he can't believe it. And David heard the words of the Philistine, verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him. They all cowered back when he charged out. And they were dreadfully afraid. And so all the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come to defy Israel. And it'll be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with riches and give him his daughter as a bride to make his father's house tax exempt in the kingdom. Then David spoke to all the men who stood by saying, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away this reproach? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And as David starts to take off his jacket and say, I'll, I'll fight him, I'll fight him, let me at him. <laughs> Everybody's going, whoa, shh, you want to get yourself killed? And there's this stir in the camp and people say, what's going on? They say, there's some whippersnapper from Benjamin, Bethlehem, and he says he's going to fight the giant. And king says, bring him over here. And David is brought to the king. And for his brothers give him a hard time and say, oh, you, you should go on home. You're just being, trying to get attention. He says, don't you think there's a cause that should excite us? And David goes to Saul. Saul says to him, are you able to go against this man and fight against him? You're a youth. He's a man of war from his youth. And listen to how David responds. David said, I have faith I can kill the giant, and the reason I have faith is because God has given me evidence for my faith. David was not being reckless. David was being calculated and courageous. Listen to what he says to Saul. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. He didn't kill it with a sling. He caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And I think because of past experience, I've got evidence, I have faith, I can also kill this giant who's being like one of them. Since, consider he's defying the armies of God. David saw this as an affront against God. By the way, it is true 
A man can kill a bear with a stick. I read in the papers a couple of years ago and I clipped it. A man walking with his dog up in Canada with almost no warning suddenly found a, a mother bear had jumped him and began to maul him about the head and the back. He tried to protect himself and the dog was barking. The bear turned to give the dog its attention. He jumped up and he grabbed a limb from a pine tree. When the bear turned back at him, he walloped the bear and managed to get it right over the head which stunned it. It stood there for a minute and shook its head. He thought, I better keep hitting. And he hit it again and got a real clean whack on the head. And the thing staggered and he hit it again. And then once it went down, he kept hitting it. And he went and reported to the rangers what happened. He was all clawed up. He brought him back. He showed him the bear. It was, it was a mother bear. A man killed a bear with a stick. You can look it up. So David's telling his experience. By the way, David put his life on the line to save the sheep. Jesus put his life on the line to save you. Amen. And he said, I'm not afraid of this giant. And so uh, he said, I think I can kill him. Finally, Saul says, go, my son, and the Lord be with you. And I think Saul is probably thinking, if we send our best soldier and he loses, we're going to look bad. If we send a kid and they win, then they're going to feel bad. And so I think Saul wasn't so sure that David was going to win. And I'll bet the, the soldiers in Israel, when they were taking bets on who was going to win in this battle, the odds were pretty low on David. They're all taking bets, 20 to 1 on Goliath. And David said, I'll go out. And Saul said, you better take my armor. David didn't want to insult the king, so he tried on the king's armor. But the Bible says King Saul was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. It doesn't say that about David. So David puts on Saul's armor, and he's looking out his neck hole like this. It's kind of like the old people you see driving down the road. They're looking through the steering wheel. You know what I'm talking about? And he tries to walk, and he says, this is going to kill me for sure. And he says, no offense, your highness, but I haven't proven this. I, let me go the way I'm used to going in my own armor, so to speak. And so he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. Someone said, if David had so much faith, why did he get five stones? David knew Goliath had four brothers and he was planning ahead. <laughs> and he put them in a shepherd's bag. Now, David, you know, when you take care of sheep all day long, um, you know, yes, I think I can knock that fig out of the tree. Zing, zing, and he got really, really good at it. He was like a sniper with a sling. And this is biblical. You read your Bible, it says that the tribe of Benjamin had 300 men that could sling stones left-handed at a hair's breadth and not miss. I had a friend of mine that lived in Alaska, and he said that some of the Inuit up there, uh, they could sling stones just like they do in the Middle East is that they would put a stone, a smooth stone, they could put it through a three-quarter inch piece of plywood. That's pretty strong. And so David chose those smooth stones. And he goes marching off into the valley. And Goliath and his armor bearer come out. And they think, uh, this is sending out a messenger boy. And they see David coming down. He's got a stick in his hand and fight in his eyes. And they're going, oh, that, I wanted him to send me a soldier. They're sending a kid with a stick. And Goliath starts to howl and bellow. And he says, come down to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And he thought that would scare him off right away. And, you know, giants don't talk like I talk. They go, come on down. And they got a deep voice. <clears throat> and David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I'm coming to you with the word of God. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. That's faith. I will strike you and I'll take your head from you. Now he doesn't even know how he's going to do that yet, but he's got faith. He thinks when the time comes, God will provide. And this day I'll give the carcass of you and the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. That, why is this going to happen? David made a prophecy that came true. He said that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. 
Has the whole world heard this story? It's a true story. Then all the assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. The battle is the Lord's. And He will give it into our hands. Don't look at the problems. Everybody looked at Goliath's shield bearer, and they looked at his helmet, and they looked at his greaves on his, his ankles, and they looked at his, his breastworks and his, his uh, sword and all the implements. They looked at his size, and everybody was looking at the problems, and they thought, how in the world could you ever overcome a guy nine feet six inches? And David said, you know, he's really only five feet 72 inches. <laughs> he had a different perspective on things. And David said, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And David wasn't afraid. He actually saw his slightness and speed as an advantage. And this always blows me away, friends. It says that uh, it was so when the Philistine arose, he came and drew near. He drew near to meet David. And David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Now, if I'm going to fight a giant first, don't make him mad first. And you wouldn't run to fight him. He was fearless because he believed God was with him, friends. And David put his hand in his bag. Why? He's running. And he takes out a stone and he whipped it with all his strength. And he, he had different caliber slings. He had brought his, his seven millimeter sling. <laughs> he had brought the, the elephant gun. He had the long one, more centrifugal force. And he slung that stone I, you know, I think when Goliath was taunting him and he got so mad, he pushed his helmet back. David wasn't even sure how he was going to get through his armor. And Goliath out there in the sun, after 40 days, he started getting hot and he had pushed his visor back on his helmet. And David saw that and he said, bullseye. As he ran and he slung the stone and he hit him right between the eyes. And the Bible says he fell on his face ingloriously with a great thud to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he struck the Philistine and he killed him. Now what does a stone represent in the Bible? Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. It's a stone in Daniel 2 that brings down all the false religions of the world. Christ is the rock. And then not only that, notice, he didn't have a sword. When he finally stands over the Philistine, he said, do you mind if I borrow this? <laughs> Goliath is down, but he's not quite out yet. And he takes Goliath's sword, which is huge. David needs both hands. He could barely lift the thing. And when that sword came down, I believe there was silence in both armies. First, there was a long silence of disbelief of everybody. And David picked up Goliath's head and said, uh, I don't think he's getting up again. And then you heard a shout go up from Israel. And all the guys said, yeah, yeah, I knew he could do it. <laughs> they didn't even believe. And the Philistines saw that and they turned and ran because they could see that God was with David. You know, friends, God will be with you in your battles. Don't look at how big the enemy is. All things are possible to him that believes. He took the giant's head with a sword Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We need to fill our minds with the Word. How did Jesus fight temptation when the giants come? It is written. It is written. It is written. Jesus had stored the Word of God in His mind. And when the devil comes to us, if we are filling our minds with the Word of God, the Word of God contains many exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. It's through these promises that we send the devil running. Amen. The Bible says, finally, the devil, when Jesus said, it is written, and then he said, get behind me, Satan. And the devil left. We can resist the devil through the word of God. You don't have to be afraid. Amen. Friends, all things are possible to him that believes. The Bible says David was a man after God's heart. Why? Because he believed in God and he didn't look at the problems. He looked at the promise of God. You know, the Bible tells us, you read the whole history of David and it's many, many chapters about David, he never lost a battle. He's one of the great, even Alexander the Great lost some battles. Caesar lost some battles. Napoleon lost some big ones. David never lost a battle. 
and he fought a lot of battles. He conquered the Philistines. He conquered the Edomites. He conquered the, the Moabites. He conquered the Ammonites. He conquered the Assyrians. Everywhere he went, you want to fight in war, you want to have David next to you because he went into battle with faith in God. Jesus is our David. Jesus is the son of David. Amen. When we are meeting the devil on the battlefield of temptation, Jesus, I'm here with you. I will never leave you and forsake you. Amen. You turn to God when you're tempted and pray and say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to win this battle. You get on your knees. You know it's almost impossible to sin and pray at the same time. If you turn to the Lord when you're tempted, He can give you victories and you can grow and you can change. He can bless you so that your marriages are better in your relationships. He can make it so you get along better with the people at work through the Spirit of God and through prayer. Whatever the practical problem, you're having trouble managing money, the power of God and Jesus in you can give you uh, power to resist the temptation to spend irresponsibly. He can change every area of your life. And this is what the Lord wants to do, wants to do for you, friends. Through faith, all these things are possible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the, the power of saving us. He will deliver you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Don't be afraid to believe. Here is the patience of the saints, Revelation 14, 12. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and what? The faith of Jesus. All things are possible through faith. Ephesians 2, verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith. You know, I can stand here all day and read verses about faith. But God wants you to know that you and God are always a majority and all things are possible with God, friends. You believe it? You know, the Bible promises that if we believe, we can be transformed. Whoever believes in Him, has faith in Him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Someone wrote a little poem once, Doubt sees the obstacles, faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step, faith soars on high. Doubt questions, who believes? Faith answers, I. You're going to hear different reports in the world today, even from the church. Some are going to spend all their time making excuses for sin. But Jesus said, don't look at the problems. Look at the promise. You can do all things through me. You can be a new creature. You come to Christ, and then you go forth Christ. Do you want to do that, friends? Do you want that experience? And you who are watching, let's ask him together, and let's believe. Father in heaven, we thank you for the assurance that though there are giants in the world and there are mountains, that you can slay the giants and you can move the mountains and you can part the oceans, that all things are possible. Lord, help us to claim and believe your word and be willing to apply it and follow you. Bless each person here with your spirit now, Lord. Help us be new creatures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, friends. Remember, these meetings are only halfway through. The best is yet to come. We hope you plan on joining us 7 o'clock Pacific tomorrow night and each following night. God bless you.